we're both passionate about this understanding of the woman's cycle at this very foundational level. Join co-hosts Jamie Rauchy and Teresa Kenny as they educate women about the beauty of the feminine design and empower women to take charge of their health. I don't see how it's healthy to alter or suppress our feminine functions and call that women's health care. Hello, Hormone Genius fans, and welcome to this episode of the Hormone Genius Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Jamie, and we're going to be talking about something very, very important to all women. And I don't think there's a lot of women who don't have an experience with this issue. Um, we're going to be talking about premenstrual syndrome, otherwise known as PMS, sometimes even referred to as PMDD if it's very severe. So PMS is everything we're talking about today. We're going to focus on what PMS is mm -hmm. and what um, you can do in a holistic way uh, or in a cooperative way to the woman's body to help manage PMS. Um, Jamie, I think, uh, I would like to start if it's okay with you telling a little bit of my story with PMS, because it truly was PMS that opened my, uh, world up to, yeah. uh, NAPRA technology and the Creighton model. I don't think I knew that Teresa. I don't think you did either. I don't think I've mentioned this before. Oh. So take me back to post-college and I'm in women's health nurse practitioner school. And I meet my now husband um, and we are dating and, and talking about even marriage. But my, my, uh, my now husband noticed that there was times that I was just not feeling well. Yeah. And he would be like, wow, you just don't seem yourself today. Like you just seem really anxious. Um, you just knew something wasn't right. And he was encouraging me to go see a doctor. And so I remember he and I sat down together and he's like, let's just write out your symptoms. Mm -hmm. So I can even picture the little sheet of paper it was on. And I wrote down my symptoms and it was like, you know, I sometimes don't feel um, real energetic. I was kind of tired. I felt like there was a pit in my stomach at times. I felt like I was worrying about things at times that it was unnecessary to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, I just, you know, I had, a, it was more kind of mood stuff, I think overall that I was feeling. So I went into my primary care physician said, you know, here's what I'm experiencing. I wrote it down for you. What do you think? And she's like, well, I think you're depressed. So I think it, you would benefit from being on an antidepressant. And I was like, hush, like in, in my life, I like really didn't think I had, was depressed. You know, that wasn't something that resonated with me at all, that word. And I, I just knew that wasn't it. And so I didn't take the prescription. I just kind of went on my way. Well, I happened to be heading into a rotation uh, for my preceptor ship with women's health nurse practitioner with a doctor that had been trained by Dr. Thomas Hilgers at Pope Paul VI Institute. And there was a nurse there and she like was already, you know, very heavily involved in Creighton model system. And she was like, you know what? I'm going to teach you how to chart your cycles, Teresa. And she just totally like off the cuff. Like when I would come in and follow this doctor, she would pull me aside and we would talk about charting. And she kind of gave me my initial introduction to charting. Hmm. And it was at that point when I learned how to chart my cycles that there was like this extreme aha moment when I realized I didn't feel that way all the time. Hey. I only felt that way like a week to 10 days, maybe before my period. And it was kind of almost like embarrassing, mm -hmm. honestly, because I was like, how did I not realize that the symptoms that I was having was related to my cycle? Right. And so fast forward a little bit more, I graduate, start working at um, now the St. Paul, the sixth Institute, and I address my issue by getting my hormone levels tested and they were terrible. I had horrible progesterone levels and I got that corrected um, using a hormone called HCG. Mm -hmm. So I have a very kind of like strong heart for PMS because I experienced it and definitely didn't know what was going on at the time and was offered something that I knew wasn't right, but ended up thankfully in the right kind of path to really finding the underlying problem. 
So that's my story with PMS. No idea. Oh my gosh. And think about the number of women who really do, who are told you have depression. Um, and meanwhile, like, meanwhile, they, they do for a week before, you know, their period, but that in large part, it's due to a hormone imbalance. You know, it'd be very interesting. So if those of you listening are like, wait a second. So, okay, here's a question for you, Teresa. So let's say I go to the doctor and I I'm, pretend I'm you, or let's say it's just you go, go back into time. And then let's say you do start taking medication for depression. Two questions. One, would the medication do anything for that time? If it was a hormone issue, number two, if you were taking this medication and you were listening to this podcast and you're hearing the story, you might think, I wonder if my hormone levels are off. And if you're not on the pill, a person taking medication for depression could still go to the doctor and check their hormone levels to see if in fact there is an imbalance um, that may be affecting the reason they're taking the pill in the fir- or the, the you know, antidepressant in the first place. Right. Right. So yeah. So like a lot of things in women's health, there's kind of, you know, outside of what we do, there seems to be kind of two solutions to women's health issues, right? Mm-hmm. It's birth control, but a lot of the times if it's not birth control, it is antidepressants because mm-hmm. women suffer with these mood issues related to the cycle. Mm-hmm. Now, would it help potentially PMS? It could, um, because uh, in our understanding of premenstrual syndrome, we know that it is hormonally related, right? Obviously it comes with the cycle, but there still is um, a question in research of really what's actually happening to cause the PMS. You know, there's been a thought, oh, well, it's just your own natural hormones. And that's just what natural hormones do is make you feel bad. Mm. Well, that doesn't sit right. Right. But there's also the thought that there is this underlying kind of deficiency in a hormone like progesterone. And we know progesterone is the calming hormone to the neurotransmitters in the brain, Mm. like GABA and serotonin. And so if there's a deficiency in progesterone, then those, those um, neurotransmitters just aren't firing, right. They're not being calmed the way they should. And there's also kind of some issues with estrogen dominance that we see too. And we've talked about xenoestrogens and people having low progesterone, but being high in estrogen, causing PMS symptoms like bloating and breast tenderness. There's almost different forms, I guess you could say, of PMS. Um, But because there is this neurotransmitter kind of imbalance, you could say, in the brain with PMS, SSRIs, like an antidepressant, um, like Prozac or Zoloft could actually help with PMS. Now, I'm not saying that would be my first option to treat a patient, um, but I'm not saying it, it isn't necessarily the absolute wrong option if someone wanted that option. It's just our approach would be very, very different. Mm-hmm. So Jamie, you know, like with charting, a lot of times we can identify people that have PMS because we're looking at their cycles, right? And we're seeing not only from my standpoint, like all of a sudden you're aware of PMS for the very first time, but there might be some charting uh, signs that tell us PMS could be a problem. Like, what do you see with that? Oh, totally. Oh, my Lanta. (laughs) Oh, my Lanta. I guess that's the first time I maybe said this in this podcast, but you guys, I say, oh, my Lanta all the time. In high school, they called me my Lanta. Isn't that a terrible name? Like a nickname? It, okay. It's anyway. a little weird, right? Because it's like a liquid antacid that old people take. So not exactly like attractive. No. I mean, I want to go on dates. Everyone's calling me my Lanta. Anyway. Okay. That was a side note. So Teresa's question, what do I see in people's charts that help me understand that there may be, you know, PMS. So there's two things that we do when we sit down with a client, client or client couple. Um, there's, uh, we ask them questions. What are your symptoms? What are you experiencing? Um, the second question we ask related to that is we ask the husband, like husband, when do you start noticing these things in your wife? Um, and we ask the husband to assist in monitoring. And often I ask him first, like I list all the symptoms of PMS I said, okay, please tell me yes or no for your wife. Do and you then know how I- many patients have said to me, they're like, well, and even if their husband's not there, I'm like, well, you could ask my husband. He would know. Yeah. You know? Everybody knows the husband would be like the honest person be like, yeah, she's got PMS bad. Yeah. Big time. Um, okay. So that's one thing that we do when we sit down, but physically like the chart itself, 
Um, I will not be surprised if they're giving me symptoms of PMS and then they have spotting, you know, premenstrual spotting before they get to their period. So we always say three pre, three days of light, very light or brown before a full period indicates like spotting that may indicate indicate low progesterone, which then can cause PMS along with other things. So that's something that we see also a short luteal phase. The luteal phase is the number of days after ovulation until the day before the next period. So like a regular average luteal phase or post ovulatory phase is like 12 ish days. Normal, we'd say like between 10 and 15 or 16, but if it's like nine or eight or seven, that's a short luteal phase, which means your progesterone is not getting to where it needs to go, um, which would very much explain why that woman is experiencing mood swings, breast tenderness, headaches, all the things. So that's what I would look for as I look at that woman's chart, the short luteal phase and then the spotting before her period. Great. Okay. So number one, awareness is key. Number two, charting and seeing sometimes those signs mm -hmm. that are evident in our cycle that tell us there could be a hormonal deficiency. Very, very helpful. So if you see a, a practitioner who's trained to work cooperatively with the woman's cycles, you can actually get your levels tested. Mm -hmm. Now, again, it takes someone who understands the menstrual cycle. You go to a Western medicine, typical OBGYN and ask for your hormones to be tested. And they don't know that you need to time it with ovulation or where you are in your cycle. You could, that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. Like if they don't say, okay, well, can you identify your ovulation? Then we need to draw your progesterone levels, you know, five days after ovulation, seven days after ovulation. If they're not using language like that, that is a red flag that the information that you get from hormone testing is probably not going to be helpful. Okay. So we need to find practitioners, providers that actually understand the menstrual cycle and understand hormone testing. And it's very simple to do when you know how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, again, if a woman can identify her ovulation, which she can do if she's charting any method, then hormone testing can be done. What we can find out again, are those progesterone levels normal? Are those estrogen levels normal? And it's not just progesterone that can be deficient. It can be estrogen that can be deficient as well. This is why hormone testing can be very valuable. Now, so you're sitting there asking like, okay, what sort of treatment options are there for PMS? Mm -hmm. So before we talk about, because I know Jamie and I will have some kind of holistic things that anybody could even do today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about just the cooperative um, hormonal treatments that have been effective in my practice and learned, you know, from practicing NAPRO technology. Mm -hmm. So progesterone can be effective. Mm -hmm. Why is it effective? Again, progesterone is this beautiful hormone that naturally is created in the body only after ovulation, and it drops right before the next period starts, which is why PMS sometimes is worse right before the period, because we're having this kind of crash in our hormones. But if you have low progesterone levels, that crash is pretty steep. It's pretty angry. Mm -hmm. It's pretty uncomfortable when you ride the roller coaster too fast down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've got to help balance that by adding back that progesterone, which is a beautiful calming hormone to the body. And, um, it can be used cooperatively. A lot of times we'll just use bioidentical progesterone in oral capsules. Sometimes I'll even make it into a compound of sustained release progesterone capsule, but easy to take very tolerable for most women. So that can be a really great treatment, but again, has to be timed with ovulation. Studies have shown that progesterone is not effective or as effective if it's not taken in cooperation with when a woman's body is making progesterone. And again, the only way to know that is through charting. Teresa. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that as people are listening to this, there may be people that think, oh yeah, progesterone. Yeah. I, I, I use it every day and it's a cream. It's a lotion because I bought it from a person who sold me something that told me it was going to be great. And every time I hear that, I'm like, no, yeah, no, step away from the lotion. Can you talk <laughs> about why we don't recommend progesterone as a cream and why we don't recommend you kind of just mentioned it. Like why it's not like an everyday thing. You yes. Yeah. No, I've seen this too. Even doctors have prescribed kind of progesterone every day in a woman cycling. And you're like, you can't take progesterone every day when you're cycling, you'll end up, like I say, bleeding like a stuck pig. Eventually <laughs> <laughs> it will mess. It'll mess it up eventually. So yeah, I mean, creams in some ways are less detrimental. They, they sometimes can do less harm because they're less potent, especially the ones that are over the counter, but 
they're not as effective. And a lot of times women are not taught to use them in the right way. Again, it really needs to be cooperative with the cycle and topical. Anything you put on your skin, you know, is important to remember it does build up, you know, in your system. So you have to be careful with anything topically. So it's best to do this in coordination with a, a healthcare provider. Oral progesterone definitely works better than creams. It's, it's been more studied. And again, it's because we have receptors in the brain and because PMS affects irritability and mood, it definitely has a better effect on it. Now, if someone really wants a cream, I am not opposed to it, but again, it has to be prescribed at the right dosage, then effective therapeutic dosage, and then used appropriately in the cycle. So you really need to understand, you can't just buy it off the you know counter. And a lot of times they'll tell you to take it days one through 14, which is the exact opposite way you should take it. Yeah. Um, you know, So it's just more effective to, to get it done right. Yeah, totally. Um, one of the things I wanted to say, um, kind of going back just a couple steps, just, to, just something I just wanted to say to the listeners real quick. Um, Teresa, it was when we were talking about doing labs and checking your progesterone and how it's very important if you're wanting to check your progesterone that again, you're working with a doctor who understands the importance of ovulation, the time of ovulation, and then timing the progesterone labs after that. Um, the, the two questions I always ask people that come to me, um, when I say, you know, there, there may be a progesterone issue. And then they say, no, my progesterone levels came back normal. My first question, this is everyone listening to me. If you have gotten your progesterone levels checked and you have an issue, um, I always ask, how many times did they, how did you get your lab work for your progesterone? They're like, just one. I'm like, okay, we got to no, that's, that's not enough. Like if you're still having an issue and you don't know why you need to get your labs done more than once. And I say, what, what day? And they're like day 21. I'm like, nope. Wrong answer again. The day 21 lab. No, because you could have ovulated day 22 you know? And so now it's messed up. Of course, your levels aren't going to be right. So the only way to really understand appropriate levels of your hormones is to know when you're charting like, or when you're ovulating. And then the doctors who are trained to understand will know what levels they should be at every other day until the end of your cycle. Yeah. I mean, I always say, again, you visualize the roller coaster, you know, and, you know, yeah. I know a lot of us aren't trained to see the cycle that way, but it is kind of like a roller coaster where the estrogen levels go up right around ovulation and then they come back down and then your progesterone levels go up after ovulation, like a nice roller coaster and come back down. And what I tell patients is, is I want to see a few places on the roller coaster. Yeah. You know, I, I sometimes like maybe I'll only want to see the peak, the top of the roller coaster, and I can compare that to what's, you know, average, but it's nice to see more places on the roller coaster. It really gives us a lot more information. And I find most women want that information. Totally. They want to know the underlying problem. You know, I'm often kind of surprised at how many women, if I say, well, we could just put you on progesterone, but you know, we could test your hormone levels. Most women want their hormone levels tested. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's important to remember that thyroid should always be tested, um, as well, you know, to, to look at the whole picture. Cause of course our endocrine system is a symphony and we don't want to forget our other hormones as well. And you know, the, we talked about this in our perimenopause episode, but just the stress factor also very important with PMS because stress causes cortisol levels to be out of balance. And that can, you know, be a detriment to our overall PMS symptoms as well. Totally. So let's just, you know, cause you ask questions about PMS and I, I feel like I, you know, we're kind of, I need to back up to the very beginning a little bit, Jamie. Um, but let's talk about what the most common symptoms of PMS are and when women see them. Mm -hmm. So typically when, and again, I'm going to kind of bring it back to when we're sitting with women, but, um, if you think about the number of days before your period, like how many days before your period, do you start noticing symptoms that gives you an understand of kind of when the crash is starting in a sense, it's giving you some understanding of that. So there may be, it might, maybe a couple days before your period starts and maybe a week before your period starts, you might be noticing these symptoms of rage or irritability, breast tenderness, headaches, fatigue, kind of being very emotional, um, mood swing, um, cravings, cry easily. And so um, those are often the things, but it's not, it's, it's something that if you think about it and you look and you're charting, you notice that there is a shift. 
you know, there is a shift if we know that like awareness, like Teresa was saying with her own story, there is an awareness. Oh, my Lanta. I just thought this is how I was every day, but I know that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at my chart and my cycle or just the month in general, I really had a hard time. So a good way to, to kind of make note of that is just to keep track of on your phone, like a note on the calendar. Like, how are you feeling? You know, has it been a lot of times in a row (laughs) where you're just feeling like you're losing it? And are you getting your period soon? You know, so we know like 20 to 40% of women at least experience PMS. And then there's a subset of like more severe PMS. And that is up to about 12% of women. Yeah. And I, I want to just say this because I think women need to know this. There are women that honestly have been diagnosed with like bipolar mental illness. And it was actually just super severe PMS. Yeah. So when you see in your charting, again, you can see this change And I often find that women will have worse PMS around ovulation when it's severe, when they have a pretty bad case of PMS, they will feel terrible. Also at ovulation, Mm -hmm. it might lessen up a little bit kind of mid luteal phase and then get severe again, about three to five days before their period. So if, if that resonates with some of our listeners that during ovulation, some women really feel an intense amount of irritability. And we know, of course, that's hormonal too. Here's a little fun fact about PMS. There's studies that show that women who are incarcerated, the vast majority of them committed their crime in their premenstrual phase. What? No. Yeah. So they did a study to, you know, find out you know, what was kind of the cause of like why you, you know, lost it on your boyfriend and, you know. I don't, in, in all sorts of petty crimes and all sorts of things. And most of the women, I can't remember the percentage, but most of them were in their premenstrual phase. Oh my gosh. You know, because we, we do, there's a lot of women who have a sense that they just don't even feel themselves, right? Yeah. They've lost almost control of who they are. Yeah. And I often find with mothers, with, with children at home, yeah. there's this guilt factor that goes with PMS, right? Because with PMS, why did I just lose it like crazy when my kids spilled the milk? I mean, I mean, totally irrational response to, you know, a common problem that happens when you have little kids, Mm -hmm. I just lost it irrationally. And now I have all this mom guilt about it. And so I, I want you to know out there, we hear you, that is a real thing and you can get that treated so that you feel more of yourself when you're in that phase and you can really, really, really make a huge difference in feeling better and not feel that way. hundred percent. Something that I think about a lot is, um, you know, sometimes it feels like in that phase that you're out of control. Like I can't control it almost. And, um, I had someone ask me once, what if the mailman was standing in your living room? What if your grandma, would you still lose it? The answer is no. So the good news is that while it seems like we can't control it, like in our minds, we know too the power of habit. So if let's say we lose it because our hormones, I always think about like walking on a tightrope and during certain times of your cycle, that tightrope is thicker. And then when during your PMS, like if you have PMS and you're struggling, it's thinning down the tightrope. You can still walk on it. It's a lot skinnier. So then you combine not sleeping well, you combine not eating well, you combine lots of things, you know? And so maybe we're in the, if we're in the habit of even just having a reactive thought, like a habit, you know, something happens and now I'm, I'm creating a habit in my brain. It's almost like I'm just creating that for myself, even not in, during the PMS time. Cause I'm, I can relate to that Teresa, like big time losing it, knowing, Oh my gosh, my tightrope is so skinny during this phase of my cycle, but add on a bunch of other things during PMS ladies or during the luteal phase, you have to take care of yourself so much. You have to sleep well, you have to eat well. It's going to help your hormones generally. So hopefully PMS less, um, but just that tightrope will be bigger that you can walk on it. And I love what you said too, trees about the guilt. It's true. It's true. Yeah. So that's a real thing. Okay. We talked about progesterone and that bioidentical progesterone is awesome for PMS. It really is. Um, so getting in, t- uh, in contact with a provider that's able to provide that for you is important. Yeah. I told the listeners at the very beginning, I use something called HCG. Yes. So I wanted to address that. Now that's a NAPRO technology protocol. HCG is a bioidentical hormone. You might hear it when we talk about pregnancy, right? HCG is the hormone of pregnancy, but it can actually be used 
very effectively for PMS symptoms. And especially when both estrogen and estrogen, estrogen and progesterone are low. And what's so cool about ACG mm-hmm. is it is making the body, helping the body make better progesterone and estrogen on its own. So it stimulates the ovarian theca cells to actually pr- increase natural production of progesterone and estrogen. So it's an indirect way of stimulating the body to enhance the luteal phase. And in the studies that Dr. Hilgers did at the Institute, at the Pope Paul VI Institute, ACG outperformed progesterone in helping PMS. So when people have very severe PMS and when they get their hormone levels tested, that can be an option. So I wanted to mention that. What about perimenopause? Same thing. I mean, in perimenopause, you can use ACG. We have a lot of patients that safely use that hormone for years to treat their cycles and PMS. And the same thing goes with progesterone. You can be on that treatment. Again, it's cooperative um, to the body. It's not, um, it's naturally increasing the production of hormones. So not going to harm them, not going to cause a risk of cancer or anything like that. These are very safe treatments. So that's awesome. But before we close up, because I know we have to wind down here, um, I'm just going to mention a few supplements because, and, and just, you know, we're going to send out a PMS, you know, toolkit. So you guys have access to the information, but, um, just a few things that holistically provide, um, help to the body and have been researched to show that they help PMS vitamin B6 is one of them. So there's a supplement called P5P that gives the natural broken down version of B6 that can be helpful for PMS symptoms. Magnesium, again, we mentioned the beautiful uh, element magnesium, and it is very calming to the body. Mm -hmm. Magnesium can be used for PMS. Calcium has actually been studied for PMS. Here's one for breast tenderness, vitamin E. In my patients who have breast tenderness, If you take vitamin E 400 units three times a day during your premenstrual phase, breast tenderness almost always goes away. So there's a simple, easy tool for breast tenderness there. Um, Jamie, what do you got for just holistic tools for PMS? So um, Vitex and Chaseberry Extract, those would be good to naturally increase progesterone. Um, Again, to know when that is, you need to know when you ovulate. So just as an FYI there, um, to take it during the second half of the cycle. Um, And then also just naturally getting to the kind of the root of the stress response um, and kind of like Teresa was talking about neurotransmitters. Um, If you're watching the YouTube channel, um, you see that there's a million essential oils behind me. I'm, I love oils and supplements and God's green earth. It just makes sense to me that he has created everything on this earth, including our bodies, of course, with beautiful intention, which is also why I love all the supplements that Teresa just gave, but wild orange, um, essential oil, make sure it's a clean oil. There's dirty oils and clean oils. If you want to learn about the difference, you can, um, email us the hormone genius at gmail.com. Um, but make sure it's a clean oil because you don't want to deeply inhale something terrible for you. But if it's clean oil, um, you can deeply inhale wild orange and it assists with like the GABA, the GABA production. Like Teresa was talking about, it's super inexpensive. Most places you can buy it for less than $10. Um, and it's very effective. They've done so many studies on citrus oils and even like soldiers that come back from war, like PTSD and things. So you can go online if you want to learn more, but just deeply inhaling it because of the olfactory nerves in our nose, as it connects to the limbic system in our brain. Um, and of course with the neurotransmitters, it's super amazing. So wild orange. And then also as Teresa was saying, um, PMS can be caused by an estrogen dominance factor. So be thinking about your diet, be thinking about drinking, not drinking out of plastic water bottles or, you know, cleaning with Windex every day and not having the windows open, you know, try to clean as naturally as you can, if you know you have PMS and just, yeah, keeping clean diet, clean cleaning, um, citrus oils are great for even cleansing the body, putting a drop or two in the water. Um, so those would be like my quick tips, but like Teresa said, we'll include even more tips in the toolbox, um, so that you guys can just see what there is to see and, and have ways to learn more. Awesome, Jamie. Well, um, this is great. I wish we could talk a lot longer about PMS. So maybe we'll do a, another episode down the road about it again, but just again, to recap, we've got again, 
PMS is real. <laughs> it affects so many women. So we want you to know there is answers and there's help for PMS and there's hormone balancing that is cooperative and good for you that can help. Fertility charting is super important. So you can get the right hormone testing and you can actually get the underlying problem solved when you have these underlying hormone imbalances. Mm -hmm. And then there's holistic things that you can do on your own diet, getting rid of xenoestrogens, cleaning up our lifestyle, reducing stress, trying to get more sleep instead of less sleep, all of those impact PMS so much. Mm -hmm. So we hope today that you learned something, that you will share this episode with the women in your life that you love. And again, we'll be sending out some more information in a toolkit PDF for you. Um, Jamie, do you have anything else you would like to say? Um, I would say if you're wanting the um, PDF to email us at the hormone genius at gmail.com, um, email us with something you've learned from this episode and a free gift to you will be that tool, that toolkit, that toolbox PDF. So yeah, no, that's it. I'm just, uh, Teresa, I learned so much for you. I love this episode. So listeners, if you loved it, let us know and share it with your pals. All right. Cool. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks for listening to the hormone genius podcast. Please remember to share our podcast with your friends and family and also follow us on social media. If you were not aware, we have a YouTube channel. So if you could like and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay in the loop with all of our latest episodes, we would appreciate that. Thank you so much for your support. We are excited to journey alongside you as you discover the beauty and the genius of your hormones.